Mr. Lubanga is sentenced to a total period of 14 years in prison. Congolese warlord Thomas Lubanga hearing his sentence at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. His 2012 war crimes conviction was the ICC's first successful prosecution. The court's then chief prosecutor was Luis Moreno Ocampo. The Argentinian lawyer had been elected as the ICC's first chief prosecutor nearly a decade earlier. His mission was to establish the court's office of the prosecutor. Tomás Lubanga's sentence will send a clear message. The era of impunity is ending. Critics say Moreno Ocampo's leadership fell short of making the ICC a truly international court of justice. Before it was introduced. During his nine-year tenure, his office launched formal investigations in seven countries, all of them in Africa. Moreno Ocampo's focus on the continent earned him accusations of double standards. Before joining the ICC, Moreno Ocampo had already become a public figure in his native Argentina. In 1985, he served as deputy prosecutor in the trial of the juntas. Nine senior commanders of Argentina's former military government were prosecuted. The war crimes charges included mass killings, kidnappings, and torture. Five people were convicted, including the former dictator, Jorge Rafael Videla. The landmark trial is now depicted in a new Oscar-nominated film. Moreno Ocampo has hailed the picture for helping people understand narratives about war and justice. He hopes an Oscar will take at least one chapter of his lifelong battle for justice to a truly global audience. Basil Rahan, The Interview. Luis Moreno Ocampo joins us now on the interview. Good to have you on the program, sir. Argentina, 1985. When you saw the film coming out, did you expect it to have this much of an impact? Well, no, it's impressive. It's very impressive. It's just in one month in my country, one million people went to the theater. And in particular, uh, young people. So the, the movie, cross time and reach the new generations, people who born later. Uh, and now Amazon platform is providing even more expansion because uh, more than mm, mm, multiplied for 10, the number of viewers, and not just from Argentina. The other day I was giving a class at Harvard and one of the students say, oh, I am from Kazakhstan and the movie is so important for us. So. The movie, the film is crossing space and time. It's Argentina 1985. It's about democracy in 2023, in the world. It's the world 2023. I like that. Tell me what the main connection is between 1985 and 2023. What's the common thread? Democracy. The, how democracy is working. People feel abuse of power, people feel no protection, people feel that the movie shows the possibility to, to, to put limits to powerful, to powerful people. Right. I feel that. Yeah. So, so uh, journalist from Brazil called me talking about January 8, 2023, where people took demonstrations in, Brazil, in Brasilia and tried to destroy institutions. And it's very similar to happen in the U.S. in January 6, 2020. So in the entire world, people are struggling how to organize it themselves, how to be respected. And the movie is about that. The movie is showing justice could be done. Taking on the generals, taking on those who people deem to be above the law, beyond the law, far too powerful. I mean, Mr. Strasera took a chance on you because you were young and other people didn't want to get involved, and you took a chance on other young lawyers in putting these generals in the dock. Yeah. What does that say about the fearlessness of youth? Well, I think that's the point. You know, the point you made, I think, is exactly the point. The movie is impacting young people, you know, who suddenly feel, oh, we can do something. And in, in fact, this was true. Uh, our the, the movie represents how we build our team with very young people 
tw most were 2021, 20, the older was 27. So the people in the 20s could do something very important. Mm. And as far as I understand, even your mother needed some convincing when it came to taking on the generals. Tell us a little bit about that journey. So you have this moment where you're thrust into the spotlight, you're in your early 30s, you become this celebrity prosecutor taking on the big guns, but your mom wasn't happy. No, because my grandfather is a general. My mother went to the church with General Videla, the, the president of the country, the, one of the dictators that we prosecute. And I never could convince her doing the investigation. I tried to explain to her what happened. And my mother said, no, no, I still, General Videla is a nice person. He reminded me like my father. He was protecting us from the guerrillas. So my mother had a, could not, it was against me. And the trial, the testimonies changed her mind. You know, it, as the movie shows, one, the testimony of Adriana Calvo de la Borde, who was a professor of physics, who had a baby get birth in the in the in a police car mm. with, with her hands handcuffed. That testimony changed my mother's mind. As a movie show, she called me the next day, and her real words were, "I still love General Videla, but you are right." He had to go to jail. So that, that for me was interesting because it's a showing we reach people that normally was against us, we reach them. How did it feel to revisit some of the emotions that you went through during that time more than three decades ago? Well, personally, it was interesting for me to recover the interaction with Tracera, you know, to see how we work together. Um, and also, I learned about. I never realized, this. I, I, all, all my life I did this thing which opened the door for kids, for young people, after as a professor or even in the International Criminal Court. So, but I am very impressed how the young people react. Now, let's talk a little bit about the lessons derived from that time and what you might have taken personally out of that period into your work as the first prosecutor at the ICC and your, and your career after that. Tell me, I mean, did it set the tone for what you did afterwards? In fact, yes. In fact, yeah, because it was my first case. So for me, it was normal the idea that the law is to protect people. It, the justice could help to protect the rights of the people. And powerful people could be accountable. So for me, that is, was normal. And for five and years, I stay as a national prosecutor doing big cases related with transition to democracy, including another case for human rights, including a case against the general for the Malvinas Parkland War, including many corruption cases against judges and governors. And the last one was about the last re military rebellion. My country had some military rebellion, but people reacted and was no more coup d'etat. So they, they failed. And we I prosecuted the last one. And after that, I left. I became a private lawyer for 10 years. I was invited to teach at Stanford and Harvard, and then they offered me to be the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And then I used a few ideas I got from my job. First, ignore those who criticize you, ignore those who clap you, do your job. You will job focus on the victims and the law, that's it. And then I use young people to collect evidence, also I keep doing that. Would it be unfair to say that in Argentina, you went after the most powerful, the generals, but at, at the ICC, you were not truly allowed to go, go after the most powerful in the world <laughs> with the most blood on their hands, potentially. Well, 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 I will tell you, the problem is Tomas Lubanga was a small fish from Turkey point of view, but if you were living in Turi, Congo, Tomar Lubanga was God. So Joseph Kony, the same. Joseph Kony was abducted thousands of kids for 20 years in Uganda. So we persecuted the people who had power, but yes, I cannot do case against America, Iraq, President Bush, because the problem was I was not the world prosecutor. 
I right. wasn't prosecuted right. from the state party of the wrong time. No, under, so under, I and that's fully understood. Thomas Lubanga, Joseph Kony, Omar al-Bashir, Muammar Gaddafi, Lauren Bagbo. There is a theme, right? It doesn't seem like the International Criminal Court. It seems like the African Criminal Court. Now, by, des <laughs> by design, there are restrictions. And we can, we can go through this. And let me, let me, let me mm. summarize it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here. So okay. the two things okay. holding you back and maybe shackling you in, in many ways, number one is the, the big five of the Security Council. So you need a resolution. And usually, at least one of those big five is involved in a conflict that has potential war crimes or crimes against humanity, or one of their friends does. So you're not going to get a resolution from the Security Council. The other one is the Rome Statute. If you don't sign up to it, or if you signed up but you left, or if you signed up and then you didn't ratify, it means that you don't have any jurisdiction. So with that in mind, it meant that, yes, absolutely, those African victims of these terrible people got justice or got the intention of justice from the ICC, but it was, in many ways, just limited to them, and you couldn't go to, to many other very big conflicts in the world. Is anything that I said wrong? No, I think you're right. The, the court had not, the court is just for countries that ratified the treaty. Turkey, for instance, is not a member of the treaty. The court can do nothing in Turkey. Uh, of the alternative is Security Council referring the situation to the ICC as was Darfur or Libya. But the two conditions to investigate the crime are had to be very serious crime, genocide, war crime, crime against humanity, aggression crime. These are the crimes. Oh. Normal crimes, corruption, for instance, is not part of the jurisdiction. But the second, con the second condition, very important, in addition, very serious crime committed, that the national government is not conducting proceedings. And Colombia, for instance, it has very serious crimes, crimes against humanity, but they were conducting proceedings against guerrilla leaders, paramilitary leaders, even members of the army. So that's why I did not open in Colombia. So there are legal conditions. But yes, you have expectation to do more, and I, I like that. I like you pushing for more. I think it's very important, pushing for more. Because do you, do you, wish, do you wish that you could have pushed for more? Do you wish that you had more leeway to open up investigations in places like Iraq during the Iraq war, 2003, hundreds of thousands no, that, of people killed. Absolutely, yes. Yes, I like that. If the court will be more, much more meaningful, if the court has global jurisdiction, all the countries in the world, absolutely, yes. Of course, and that's the goal. That's why for me, this is like iPhone one, okay? Then you, you improve that iPhone two. So people have to keep influencing, pushing for more, and more is about the court having really a world court. Right now, it's a court for 121 states, no more, no, no less, no more. Does that need to change? Could be improved, that's the point. New Im generation- Improve how? To keep, yeah, having all the countries our own, hmm. all the countries. And very important, political leaders, because the most important is not putting people in jail. The most important is no political leader committing the crimes. And that is yeah, but, what we... But the lesson to the political leaders, whether they're dictators or not, they could be democracies committing potential war crimes. Yes. The lesson that seems to be derived from all of this is not don't do genocide, don't do war crimes, don't do crimes against humanity. It's don't sign up for the Rome Statute. Or if you're, if you're signed up, leave, because then the court can't touch you. That's a very nice comment. I like it. Yes. We have to change. We, understand, we have to understand them and fix that. Mm. Yeah. So who has the power to fix that? Yeah, I think political leaders. Because, for instance, Africa Union was campaigning against me, and I told them, guys, I cannot do that legally, but if you like uh, Iraq, move the Security Council. Make pressure on the UN Security Council mm. to discuss yeah. Iraq. So put, put in, make influence outside. So that's what we need. We need national leaders understanding this and putting pressure on the big countries not to do this. I remember, it, the, I remember yeah. some of the pressure on you or the criticism of you when you had indicted Umar al-Bashir, uh, war crimes, yes. crimes against humanity, genocide. You wanted him arrested. He was traveling to places and nobody wanted to arrest him for you. There was, there was an element of a sort of third world, global south solidarity against you because for 
some of the aforementioned reasons people saw the ICC as a racist court or only targeting Africans, whether that was used by demagogues just instrumentally or not is almost beside the point. They did have a point. How do you feel about how the Bashir saga played out? Because he didn't end up in the ICC for the well, re well he, didn't, he didn't end up at the time that you wanted him in the ICC for crimes against Darfuris. It took for almost, a, well, a decade to pass, the Sudanese to have their own revolution to decide that they wanted justice. And the first thing they went after him for was corruption, right? All, all the gold and the money and so on. So he will face justice in some way, but maybe not necessarily for the crimes in Darfur. How do you feel about that? I think it's, it's important what happened with Bashir. As you're you are right, when I indict Bashir, everyone, including Western countries, were against me. Oh. Because I say, according with the law, president has no immunity before the ICC. And then I did it, and I was not supported. But that was my lesson in my country. I don't care if my mother supports me or not. I do my job. Oh. And I did my job on, on Bashir. And something you have to understand, the expectation, international justice expectation, is much more complex. You cannot, you, you cannot a global police going to arrest a president, but it's a constraint. From the beginning, from since I indicted President Bashir, he was constrained. He was in fury with us. He had problems to travel to some countries. He was trying to overcome us, and at the end, after ten years, he was he, he's in jail, mm. and still. Mm. Sudan is discussing with the new prosecutors to deliver him to the Hague. So that was the process. It's not so automatic, so clear, like a, like a national prosecution, but it's a process to transform the world we are living. There are current conflicts that involve UN Security Council members and countries that are not signatories to the Rome uh, statute. Um, Syria, yeah. you have Yemen, and now you have the conflict uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, right? There are still those who believe that there's the potential for international justice still. Karim Khan, who is in the position that you were once in, it was you, then Fatih Ben Souda, and then uh, Karim Khan, he says that there seems to be enough evidence to show that uh, crimes were committed within the jurisdiction of the court. What, what exactly are his options? Because it seems almost impossible. No, oh, well, the... We need to do justice in, in Ukraine, in Syria, and, and in the war on terror. So all these matters, all these issues are important. Ukraine accepted the International Criminal Court jurisdiction, and Karim Khan, the prosecutor of the SEC, is active on that. The Ukrainian justice can do war crime, but the Ukrainian judges cannot prosecute President Putin himself. The International Criminal Court is the only institution who can do it. And therefore, the, it's very difficult to, in, to prove President Putin's responsibility on a specific war crimes, because he, he's not involved in bombing hospitals or theaters or, or here but, there. But, those are, but, but or, in a way, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Those, in, in a way, are just details, aren't they? Because, again, going back to the fundamentals, Russia is a UN Security Council member. It can veto any resolutions, right, block. And on the other hand, it's not a signatory to the Rome Statute. So there's no jurisdiction. So no matter no, what no, the no, details yeah. are, there's no possibility of uh, Vladimir Putin or any Russian generals even ending up in The Hague, right? No, no, no. But since 2014, Ukraine accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. So, so it means if, if crimes happen in in the boundaries of Ukraine, then there's yes. space to work yes. within. Okay. Yes, exactly. And that's why Karim Khan is so active. And there's one crime that he can really indict President Putin immediately. It's called forced displacement as crime against humanity. Uh -huh. The Russian intervention in Ukraine removed millions of people from the border between Ukraine and, and Russia. And that is a crime against humanity. And for that crime, President Putin could be indicted tomorrow. I want to step back for a second, and I wonder mm -hmm. about pressure. How much okay. pressure were you under when you were in that role for nine years? And oh. by whom? By everyone. Everyone. Big Name countries, them. More, <laughs> big countries, small countries, NGOs, everyone criticized you. 
I remember one ambassador explained to me, you have to understand, prosecutor, my job is to control you. So that is a permanent. You have permanent different countries pushing you, but you have to, that's why part of the job is to ignore criticism, to ignore pressure, and just do your job. When for three years, I received the Palestinian Authority request to intervene in Palestine. From the first day, I told the minister, minister, I understand how important it is, but you have to understand, the status say a state can accept jurisdiction, and it's not clear that you're a state. The minister, Hassan, was so smart, he told me, fair enough, prosecutor, there are doubts, let me brief you about it. And I said, OK, you brief me the time you want. And he was briefing me for three years. <laughs> and in the middle of these three years, I had so much pressure from mm -hmm. different countries, including the U.S., in particular the U.S., to close this and say, no, the media is still briefing me. Well, when the media... so, well, just, just to be clear, the U.S. putting pressure on you because you were potentially looking into the Israelis. Yes, exactly, because the U.S. was trying to protect Israel, and therefore, they won't be closing this possibility. And I said, no, legally, they have the right to give me the arguments. I don't know if the arguments are good, but I, I will listen first. And then I listened to them, and in those days, they were mm. no state. They were not considered a state. That's why I rejected But they were prepared. During the three years, they prepared themselves. And a few months after I rejected them, they went to the General Assembly of the UN, and they got a vote accepting Palestine as a state from that day on. Although, then, yeah, I mean, although not much has changed in the, in the sense of international justice, has it? Well, now it's an investigation open again on, the, on crimes committed in the territory of Palestine. Right. And a few, few days ago, a few weeks ago, the UN General Assembly requests an opinion to the International Court of Justice on the occupation. So there are different, the two biggest courts, the International Criminal Court is investigating the crimes in Palestine. The, IC, the International Court of Justice requests, will receive a request to make a decision on the occupation of Palestine. So these two issues are there. How we can implement them, that's a different issue, but the things are moving. Not the speed we want, slow, but are moving. But the alternative of that is killing each other, and, and that is a bad alternative. Over the years, you, you must have received a lot of dockets. Lawyers come to you with cases of, of evidence, saying we want you to investigate these potential war crimes, these potential crimes against humanity. Is there anything that you received that you wanted to prosecute, but you could not? No, no. What we... From the beginning, we defining a clear process how to do this, how to analyze the complaints and decide where to go. And it was a formal process run by a specific area of the office. And they sub submit to us, to the leaders, the proposals, and we discuss and we follow up. So the, I try to reduce any discretion and transform it into a very clear legal protocol. And we did that. Mm. And as we circle this back to the very beginning, and we talk about Argentina 1985 and your long and illustrious career, not without some controversy as well. Oh, the, my God, no. <laughs> and criticism, and, and you, you take the criticism quite well and you, you engage with it, which is great. The, the one lesson that you would impart to our viewers, to young prosecutors, to young lawyers, to those who want a more peaceful and just world from your beginnings in Argentina in 1985 right up to now, that lesson would be what? We have to keep engaging with justice, not just lawyers. We need people opposing crimes. We need people opposing violence, because that's a problem. Starting the war in Iraq made President Bush popular. Even today, even after the find that there's no um, chemical weapons, the U.S. Congress maintained the authorization to use military force in Iraq. President Putin is more popular today in Russia than before. So our leader became more popular making war, and we have to change that. That is something we have to change. Yeah. Cannot, so, okay. We cannot do that. Would so it, we can use that. It's I'm, not change. No, I'm, no I'm interested that you mentioned George W. Bush. 
all things being equal, on an equal playing field, given all the tools that the court should have to be the international criminal court and not the African criminal court, as I mentioned. I, I, I apologize for that, but the point uh, still stands. All things being equal, would Bush meet the standard of being somebody who had to be held to account in the halls well, of power in The Hague for starting the Iraq war? The most serious crime is aggression crime. And it's obvious that... In I think it's I think it's George Bush trying to call you. <laughs> no, please go ahead. <laughs> I like this time. <laughs> uh, aggression was obviously committed in Iraq, obviously, and uh, the problem in those days the court has no jurisdiction because it was not yet defined the crime. Now it's defined it. That's why it's it's it's, it's different. But the clear crimes committed by George Bush in Iraq was aggression crime. And that's more important than war crimes, because there were less than 50,000 people who died as a consequence of mm. war crimes in Iraq, by different parties. But 250,000 people died as a consequence of the war. Mm. So U.S. control war crimes, but it's not controlling well, launching wars. And that's the problem. And now Russia is doing the same. And if it's going this way, we, we have no future. I don't know if you know, it's a video game called Fortnite. 100 people play against each other. The winner is the one who killed all the others. Yeah. And so the winner will be alone. And that will be the world, one country alone in the world, or no one will be alone in the world because we kill each other if we are not inventing new mechanisms to manage conflicts. That's why it's not just about lawyers. It's about people understanding how to manage conflict with no violence. And this, this conversation was a good example. I'm glad. Luis Moreno Ocampo. I wish you all the best, and I thank you very much for joining us on the interview. Thank you very much. I hope the, the movie will receive the Oscar, because the... Yeah, good luck at the Oscars. They, yeah. <laughs> because in, in a few days, it will be the Oscar. Yeah. Imagine the Amazon platform multiplied for 10, the number of people who watch the movie. Yeah. That would be Lionel Messi tweet about... Yes, I saw ID. that. Yeah, I saw that. That would apparently add 2 million viewers in Amazon platform. Mm. So the Oscar will multiply more and then we reach more people. That's why we need not just law, we need popular movies and Lionel Messi to expand the idea we stop wars. Ah, brilliant. Ah. Okay. Take care. Good to talk to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.